and I work as both Jeff and I work as what we call shared employees. We both work for both Centennial Water and Sanitation District and the Highlands Ranch Metro District. David, as you mentioned, they are two separate organizations. I like to kind of refer to them as sister districts, if you will. So there's a number of shared employees, so that keeps things lean and very efficient here in the organization. Did someone have a comment? Okay. No. All right. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, as community relations manager, I, I've been here since 1997 and worked for the organization for 24 years in the community that I get to call home. And Jeff um, Case is director of public works and engineering. He's been here since 1981 from the very beginning and has worked 40 years on the Highlands Ranch project. Uh, he was also manager and over was overseeing the renovation of the Highlands Ranch mansion from 2010 to 2012. And as I'm sure you've seen the mansion, he and the crews there did a wonderful job with that renovation. So we wanna thank the Historical Society tonight for the opportunity to present. Um, to give a brief introduction, I just wanted to mention that Centennial Water and Sanitation District has served Highlands Ranch for 40 years, of a population of over right around 100,000 um, people. And we're an innovative district. We're proud to provide water and wastewater services that you'll hear about more tonight. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Jeff Case. Wonderful. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Case, as Sherry has kind of given a, a, a very nice intro, and um, I will do my best to um, stay on task and, um, and hopefully speak clearly enough um, uh, hopefully my voice doesn't, uh, doesn't fade at the end, but at any point, please uh, let me know. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a kind of just a, a general introduction, um, most of which you have seen with some of the other presentations that have occurred about the, essentially the genesis of this community. And, um, and uh, as we all know, and, and most all of us have benefited from, um, we had a Mission Bureau company come uh, and find property uh, back in the late 70s and decide uh, that Highlands Ranch would be um, one of their great uh, adventures in uh, creating a, a uh, well-planned community um, on the southern end of, of Douglas or of uh, Denver. Um, the, um, the foundation of the community, of course, was Mission Viejo had such a, uh, a, a wealth of experience in their Southern California project that they, they understood a lot about what to do to bring a community here, not just to build homes, but to truly bring a community. Um, Douglas County, of course, was a bit sleepy at the time. Uh, personally, I worked up on the north end of town, and, um, and by the time you got County Line Road, I mean, it was pretty much you know, pronghorn and uh, an open space, but um, but we um, you know, we saw that um, uh, early on that, that Mission Bio wanted to uh, create a division and and uh, and was here for the long haul. I mean, for me, joining uh, as a young engineer in '81, um, hearing that you know this is going to be a 30 plus year old project, and uh, uh, you know, it was kind of hard for me to fathom. Um, and uh, my my work experience have been you know three years three to five years at, at a place so so but as as we all sit here now in retrospect i mean it's it's come through and with flying colors in my mind um so the the outline that i'll be walking through is um um is a little bit about the formation as i've been talking about the evolution of a water portfolio i think it's no no surprise to anybody that Nothing can exist in Colorado without a good, strong water portfolio. I'll talk a little bit about how we move through the community in, in concert with the developer and uh, the county and uh, in, in trying to match up our infrastructure with the, the needs as the community grew. Um, some of the innovation that, and successes that we have had and then some of the future opportunities because it's um, like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. It's never done. Um, so. Um, so the new town of Highlands Ranch, um, the uh, guiding principles, as, as you've, I'm sure you've heard before from uh, some of the leaders, was to create a fully integrated um, and comprehensively planned community. The, um, 
uh, you know, was something that, quite honestly, um, certainly Douglas County had never seen. And uh, I would say that many parts of Colorado would never seen something to the scale that we had here. And um, <clears throat> the uh, image of the mansion back in 1980, you know, kind of sitting out on the prairie. And, um, you know, you had a road coming in from Santa Fe and you had a road coming in uh, off of County Line Road. And those were the roads in and out. And then other than that, a lot of pasture. Um, so at the very beginning, um, Jim Tepfer and, and uh, of course, other um, associates of his went to the county, spent quite a bit of time in working on the, the plan, explaining what they, had, they would like to envision, understanding some of the questions and concerns, and uh, making a various series of presentations and workshops in order to, to um, come through with the, um, the plan community master plan. The, um, the color map you see there is um, the, the very first of the um, development plans. And, um, and you know, what's interesting is that, you know, there are some changes here or there, but true to form, it's really, it's really come around and then pretty similar to what, what you see there. Um, <clears throat> the anticipated 30,000 new homes, um, you know, they, they can, uh, of the 21,000 acres, you know, they, they made a strong commitment to open space recreation to community services. And of course, as part of that, since this was not gonna be a city, was we needed to look at providing services through a, a, um, a collaboration of a, of a variety of governments and organizations. The, um, um, there was a lot of pushback. I'm sure Jim kind of gave you some stories about that over the years and um, about, you know, there was, um, Colorado was not exactly um, uh, real warm to some some types of development, and and certainly um, a large development from California wasn't exactly um, welcomed with open arms originally. But um, there there were concerns about you know Denver starting to grow um, at a fairly rapid rate. People were discovering it. I personally came here to go to college in 1973 up in Fort Collins, and um, and found it to be a pretty darn nice place to live. Um, so I think that the word was getting out and uh, there was concern about that. Um, but nonetheless, there was a concern also about was this going to be a burden on, on the existing residents and the existing communities. And uh, so Mission Viejo created a, uh, a comprehensive plan with a, a variety of consultants. And they actually had a company, Jack G. Rob Company, which is the company I actually work for, an engineering company. And they performed a lot of analyses and then also outsourced um, all types of things with um, from scientists and experts uh, from the state of Colorado in order to, you know, answer the questions that needed to be answered. Um, they also developed a concept of a uh, coordinated government, and um, and and that involved um, a variety of, of agencies, um, several of whom you've already heard from, and I'm sure you'll hear more of. Uh, certainly, uh, the uh, the master developer Mission Viejo and Shea Homes, Douglas County Government and Douglas County Services, the um, Highlands Ranch Metro Districts Community Association, Douglas County Schools, and um, and at that time the Littleton Fire and Rescue um, for fire emergency services, and the Library District. You know, um, the library was just you know just barely starting at the time, but um, I mean there was. There were facilities down in Castle Rock, but but you know nothing up in here, and uh, so you know kind of a nice comprehensive look at at you know what do you need for a community? This is not about just selling homes. This is about about creating a new town. Um, so one of the the features of that was to create the agencies that would reside within the community that you're creating. These are not ones that essentially overlap into other parts of the of the county. And so those were the Highlands Ranch Metro District and uh, in this case, Mission Viejo Water and Sanitation District. And uh, I will not read all that. There'll be a quiz later on those pages, but um, I will not read all the items on the, um, um, on the, the various authorizing things. But in essence, I, you know, I think I think we 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 get the notes um, that um, you know we are a, a water and sanitation district. The um, 
the state legislature allows certain elements of um, of service um, and uh, by the various utilities. So we, we will jump on to mission, vision, and guiding principles. Um, and uh, this is an element that, um, frankly, has just been encapsulated um, formally in the last couple of years. And this is an element that Centennial has always um, tried to demonstrate, and we felt important to uh, convey this to our customers and to our partners. And uh, within that, we have our, in our core values of safety, teamwork, vision, excellence and service, and integrity. Um, all, all of these are, all our employees carry these cards. Um, we, we try to reinforce these, these values in all that we do. We look at it as we make decisions um, on, uh, on budgets and, and other elements. Our, our vision, of course, is to set the standard of excellence to a community-based water and wastewater utility service to improve practice, uh, innovative practice and finance operations and resource management. And um, so with respect to that, how do we do that in our potable water supply? We manage and protect the water supply portfolio. One of the things that draws Centennial separate from many of the utilities that exist in Colorado is that for one, we we are a full service uh, treated and treated water and treated wastewater. Um, we there are not a lot of communities that have a, a utility that provides both water and wastewater. Some of the bigger cities people might not understand um, have maybe one or the other shared to a, a different agency. Um, we also uh, do not buy our water treated. We 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 capture our water as a raw water source and we deliver it to the community as such. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we move through there. Our sanitary sewer system, as I pointed out, um, we, we treat that at our Marcy Gulch wastewater plant, which is located off of Santa Fe. Um, finance and administration, um, it, you know, of course, an absolute essential to any organization. If you don't, if you don't have your books right, if you don't know how you're managing your money and uh, and figuring out how to fund things, then you're never going to get off ground zero. And um, and we've always been blessed with such an outstanding staff on that. Um, asset management, capital improvement program, um, certainly in the first, uh, let's say, 25, 30 years, a lot of our capital improvement was dictated as, as development occurred. And uh, so we, we had a master plans from the very beginning as to what to do. And then it was a matter of figuring out timing in order to provide service. However, I will say that as we have grown to an age of, of almost 40, um, we have continued to look at our assets and um, have some, um, taken some great strides in some um, um, management systems in order to allow us to do preventative maintenance and then also do predictive um, plans for some of the replacement that we may need to do and upgrades at times. Um, our service area, as you know, we say is, is all Highlands Ranch, um, although there are a couple small parcels that are adjacent to Highlands Ranch that were just not big enough to have their own utility. And um, under the condition that they were able to provide water supply, as in water, water rights, um, we were able to incorporate them into our overall plan. They, they, you know, they came along, they pay everything that our customers have had to pay along with um, uh, some additional costs associated with their particular service. And, um, and those are, are, um, are identified in, you know, on the map there. Um, we do have a couple partnership agreements with uh, some adjacent utilities, um, the Castle Pines North um, Metropolitan District, and uh, that has to do with some water that they actually have acquired um, along some water rights and they don't have the ability to treat it where it comes. And therefore we take that water, we treat it and we deliver it to them, um, you know, at a cost of course. And Roxborough Water and Sanitation District, a very similar situation with that. Once again, working with partnership whenever we can to, um, you know, to come up with a collective um, uh, um, solution for providing service. The uh, as I spoke before, the evolution of a water supply, one of the things that we have had to do is, is identify how we can provide water to the community. And um, in Colorado, 
um, <clears throat> if you ever want to um, read a lot, a lot of books and, um, and, uh, and maybe get a little bored, but a little fascinated, certainly confused, the, uh, the Colorado prior appropriation system will play right into that. This, um, I'm, I'm sure many, many of you probably, 90% um, of you probably read Centennial at one time or another. It certainly gave a great profile of what, what water in Colorado was about. And, um, and the prior appropriation system is very important. It's a property right. It doesn't matter if you're next to the river or away from the river. If you have certain rights and, um, uh, and, and it cannot be taken from you from somebody that is considered a junior right that comes in later. Um, as we all know who have lived here, Colorado is a semi-arid state. And as such, there's certainly not um, Boku amounts of water out here. So the um, ability to have water rights is, um, is, is essential to being able to somehow uh, provide service, whether it be for your, your home, for your community, um, you know, it's, it's just core to the value there. Um, as you can see in the map, we've got the South Platte River Basin and um, the, um, uh, it, the total flow to the South Platte is about 1.1 million acre feet per year. And, um, and that's, that's essentially a lot of water. Um, uh, some of that water comes from the Western Slope. It's from projects that primarily Denver Water created um, as they went through. And, um, but, um, and, and it flows into the Platte River through a variety of tunnels. I do wanna add one quick thing. Um, just going to use the term acre feet and just so you all know an acre feet is one acre in surface one foot deep so imagine one acre in surface a foot deep and that's the measurement he's referring to so um uh yes as, as sherry said the, the those terms of art um and within the um the the flow regime of the south plant river and uh, you all, we also have 13 major agricultural reservoirs downstream. And, um, and as I'll talk in the next slide, agriculture still represents the, the large amount of, of water use coming out of the South Platte Basin. And frankly, for pretty much all of Colorado. Let's move to the next one. As you can see there, 86% of the water coming down the South Platte Basin that is needed in any given year um, is used for air, for agriculture. Not all up here, some of it is as far away as Fort Morgan. Um, it's, um, it's a water right. It's been acquired oftentimes by homesteaders and um, early in the, um, uh, in the evolution of, the, of, this, of this state, frankly, before it became a state. Um, and uh, the urban development that has occurred really only represents about 6% of the water use um, that, that comes down the South Platte River. Still a significant amount of water, but, um, but agriculture still is, is, is vital to this community, uh, excuse me, to this state. Um, and uh, with respect to Centennial, we are, we are somewhat unique. Um, we, we rely on a couple, on two different sources of supply. Um, I will say that there are some communities that rely on one or the other, Denver water, of course, the you know most notable is uh, is is almost entirely um, surface water. I mean, they 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 have a legacy of century, and um, and they they have developed a very large and sophisticated surface water system. Um, Centennial will rely, and I will speak to that in a few minutes about our surface water supply. But we also have a uh, groundwater system. And it's it's what's known as a Denver Basin. It's a uh, it's a, a geologic formation that that uh, starts at the, essentially the foothills, uh, you know, at the Hogback, and and goes out east of about Kiowa. You know, it it goes out for a long ways, and it's a uh, it's a non tributary groundwater basin that uh, of which water has accumulated over the eons. So um, in the next slide. Um, I talked a little bit about the water supply, the, the long-term water surface leases that, that we look to get, um, as well as, unfortunately, you know, you can't get all long-term. So you look at some of the junior water rights, you look at, at groundwater, um, 
uh, the ability to get a certain number of wells. And um, when you can, uh, not all communities can, can access groundwater. And, um, and then we also partnered on a couple other projects that um, have occurred over the years. The most recent one being the, um, um, the WISE project, which is with uh, four different, uh, in addition to the Centennial, four different um, water providers in the uh, South uh, Denver area, South, actually Northern Douglas County primarily. But um, in order to look at, at um, a partnership with, um, with Denver and Aurora on some water that they're able to um, capture from their reuse plants and, um, and send this direction. Um, as far as reservoirs go, um, Centennial has interest in both in McClellan Reservoir, South Platte, a reservoir known as Tingle, which is up in South Park, and Chatfield. And I'll talk about each of those here in a few minutes. When you look at the next map, you'll see um, kind of an overview of, um, of our system. I realize it's, it's kind of hard to read, but it's more about the essence of what, what Centennial has had to do. Many of the communities um, on the Front Range have had to reach out for a long ways in order to, um, to identify water rights. Um, Thornton would um, at one time was in, in down in South Park quite a bit. You know, certainly Denver. Denver is is you know statewide in their interests. Aurora is. Um, other communities on the northern end have gone up and do a project called the, the Northern Project, and even uh, taken water up from the Big Thompson. And uh, so so there are um, um, you know water exists where water exists, and therefore sometimes communities have to figure out ways to acquire that water or to figure out ways to transport it. And um, this is um, a way that we are able to transport it. Now, once again, the map's a little hard to read, but it's um, but you can look at it later, perhaps. It, it essentially shows that in many ways, location, 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 you know, Highlands Ranch is actually in a great place. Um, I mean, you know, uh, um, back when Wade Phillips extended the, the boundaries of the property out to the west, and then, of course, it, it remained even with Lawrence Phipps and um, where Chatfield Reservoir now exists, used to be part of the, the Phipps Highlands Ranch. And um, while they had a great location along the South Platte, the mouth of the South Platte River, that didn't necessarily mean they got water out of it. But it does provide opportunity. And Centennial has looked at those opportunities when possible to um, possibly use some of the infrastructure that uh, could be created in that area. That That is a uh, unique opportunity uh, based on location that we have here. And it does show the network of the reservoirs that I'll be talking about in a minute here is Chatfield, the South Platte Reservoir, which is located just north of C-470, west of um, Santa Fe, and then McClellan Reservoir off of County Line Road. So as I said, being at the front of the line doesn't really mean anything in water rights. Um, while we are at the, 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 the great location for this, um, that doesn't mean that we can grab water and, um, and leave some farmer out in Weld County a little dry. Um, you know, that, that doesn't exist and isn't allowed. And, um, and also back in the um, 1800s when, when um, irrigation companies were starting to get um, be developed and partnerships were being created by a variety of landowners um, that were not at the mouth of the South Platte, who wanted to, to be able to convey water there without having to uh, risk the, the, um, the flows or the variances of the South Platte River, they created irrigation companies, ditches, if you will. And, um, and you know, right, right on our doorstep, we have some of the most historic ditches in the Denver region, um, you know, right, right, you can walk up to them or walk along them if you'd like. Um, the, um, the city ditch, which um, uh, originally was created um, by uh, one of the founders of the city of Littleton, and then it was extended further to go all the way up into Denver, and it uh, provided water for City Park. Uh, there's still, I mean, it still runs, and there are still elements of it through Wash Park and other areas of Denver. Very important ditch. Um, and that, that ditch was started in the early 1860s you know, around the time of the Civil War, if you can imagine. So um, so that ditch still exists. It runs along 
the um, uh, west side of Santa Fe and Centennial uses that to deliver water, Centennial and Englewood in particular. Um, Highline Canal, of course, you know, just such a, such a star uh, facility over 70 miles and, um, and, and conveyed water all the way through Denver. It has been in the process of a, of a repurposing and um, but certainly was an element um, that existed for for well over a century. Um, Last Chance Ditch is a ditch that's not as well known, but it also existed um, and took water from the the, the mouth of the Platte River before Chatfield existed, and um, and still conveys water to Centennial. In fact, to our our uh, South Platte Reservoir, and the Nevada Ditch, which is a ditch also that travels right in that area. And those all date from the 1800s. Uh, not much to look at, but, but, but a, lot of, a lot of history, a lot of heritage there. Um, so as we moved along, knowing that we couldn't count on the flow of the river and we couldn't always count on uh, buying rights in the ditches, um, we also recognized that storage was very, very important. Um, and uh, while the numbers are on the screen there for your perusal at, at a later date, um, we have a very um, diverse group of uh, rights for those reservoirs. And, um, and, you know, we tried to do our best to take opportunities and look at ways that we could acquire that because seasonally water comes through, uh, through Colorado. And of course, you know, look at what we just experienced over the past weekend, a lot of water, a lot of snow melt. And, um, but without the ability to capture and store that for later in the year, it will and it will go downstream and end up in Nebraska. And uh, so, to the extent that you you can capture some of that and create storage, that will allow you um, to have some durability later into the year. Um, McClellan Reservoir is um, is a reservoir that has existed. It's the oldest reservoir of the of the three that we uh, participate in, and. Um, and it was built by the city of Inglewood back in the 60s, and it travels along County Line Road. Um, the Mission Viejo, I, 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 uh, well, I give them credit for a lot of stuff. They, they were quite visionary, and when they arrived here and uh, started to look at things, they reached out and they identified that city of Inglewood actually had a lot more storage than they really wanted, and there were some partnerships that could be created there, and uh, and as such. One of the very first agreements that um, Mission Viejo Water and Sanitation District entered into was an, a, an agreement with the city of Inglewood for a long-term 100-year lease agreement um, with um, for uh, use of about half of McClellan Reservoir. Very, very important and, uh, and provided us with the surface water storage and supply for our very first water treatment plant. Um, as you can see there, and uh, if, if, if you think about it, driving by McClellan, if you looked at it probably in November, it looked pretty dry, but certainly right now it's, um, it's quite full. The location. Yeah, and the location is, um, it's on County Line Road and it's um, just essentially if you come off Lucent Boulevard, you'll, I won't, you won't run right into it hopefully, but uh, you will run right up to it. So, um, so it travels right along there. It's, um, it's it's a beautiful reservoir. Um, the next one is kind of a, um, I, I think a real hats off to our leadership, to our board of directors. Um, the um, we we did participate in the Two Forks project in the in the late eighties, and uh, when the Two Forks project um, was you know was not approved, um, we started looking at other opportunities, and one of the opportunities that uh, became apparent was a gravel pit that existed on the on the north side of C470 just west of Santa Fe and um, and Kiewit, um was uh, working that and pulling the gravel out of it and the board entered into an agreement to acquire the land enter into a, um, a mining agreement such that essentially you know let's pay them to I mean let's let's have them remove the, the gravel sand and gravel they sell it um, and um, and then we will get up a the, the the foundation of a water storage reservoir out of the deal um, was a great a great opportunity because at the end of the day you end up with a, a a beautiful amenity 
a, a, a very stable water supply for a community. And quite honestly, it was one of the only uh, surface water uh, storage reservoirs that has been created on the South Platte system in the past 30 years. Um, quite innovative. And uh, you can visit it, can't, can't fish in it or can't boat in it, but, um, but it's, um, it's, it's quite interesting. And it was a kind of a tribute to the um, partnership uh, that happened. Um, and, um, and certainly throughout that, that whole thing, there, there was, um, um, you know, when I spoke of the last chance ditch that the, the South Platte Reservoir was also um, uh, filled by the last chance ditch. And in fact, um, it still exists and we have water running in through there. Um, I, I will say that um, each of these took a long time to develop. And um, there was a lot of, of, um, of opportunity, a lot of, a lot of dialogue with our boards, with, um, with other leaders in the water community. And, um, and, and I will say that um, uh, a particular individual has, uh, has stood out because of his history with, with Denver and uh, Mr. Joe Blake. And, um, and I'll talk briefly about Joe later. Um, and, um, but, um, but certainly looking at, at how best we could work with these various communities, these various water entities, these various sometimes private um, organizations in order to look at, uh, to develop something that was a mutual benefit to everybody. And, um, and, and Mr. Blake, you, you were quite, quite the negotiator, I will say. And um, Chatfield Reservoir is another project that um, has its early roots. First started in 1994, the, um, the, the thought of possibly looking at reallocating some of the storage in there. Chatfield was built after the 1965 floods and it was, it's owned by the Corps of Engineers and it was built primarily as a flood control dam. But of course, it's, it's also um, one of the most visited um, state parks in the, in the system. And, um, and at, at the beginning, there was conversation. And frankly, I don't think it came on very uh, welcome ears that, you know, could we look at a, a way of, of repurposing some of the storage, allowing some increase in the storage in order to allow some of the, the communities to use that. And, um, and that took a long, long time. I mean, as you can see, the project just was wrapped up in the last couple of years. And that was not because anybody was asleep at the wheel. That's because it took that long. And we have some very talented water resource staff um, who, um, who persisted on that. Uh, Mr. Rick McLeod is one of the individuals um, who uh, just stayed fast and steady with it. And, um, and as a result, we, we received a very successful project. And getting storage on the South Platte mainline system is just, it's so hard to get. And so um, this, is, this is quite an achievement because in Centennial, of course, participated with other communities on this too. There are other water entities, including Denver Water, um, who were part of that joint project. The, um, of the water sources that we have, um, you can see that we have, um, um, we have eight, eight surface water rights and we have priority dates from 1872 to 1995. And, um, and we certainly have contracts to use some of the water. Now, 1872 sounds like a long time ago, but quite honestly, in the world of water rights, it, it isn't necessarily the most senior by any stretch. And, um, but it does provide us with some very um, important ability to divert water uh, during certain parts of the year. Um, we have our, our, ground, our deep non-tributary groundwater uh, system. Once again, that was a, a system that allows us to, um, to use it in a, in, in a term used as conjunctive use, where you can combine both your water, surface water and groundwater, and uh, use those two together. Certainly in wet years, average years, you use a lot more surface water. When it gets a little dry, you, you turn more to your groundwater system. And, um, and that, that's a flexibility that has allowed Centennial um, to, to look at some opportunities as we move through this. Um, the next slide shows you kind of a, a, a distribution of some of our wells. Our wells are in the three formations. There's the Rapaho, the Laramie Fox Hill, and the Denver formation. They're all within the Denver basin. So not to confuse it too much there, but, um, 
but these um these um can go as deep as 1500 feet they're considered non-tributary so water that is taken out of these does not impact water tables in anywhere in the, the immediate area it is water that has been stored uh you know in geologic terms for you know millions of years and um and it's 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 water that you know is used as an important to, to many communities in douglas county um one of the things that we identified as part of that was the ability to create um a recharge program now as as much as you would think a recharge program would be something everybody would love to have the state wasn't so sure about it and so back in the early 90s <clears throat> excuse me we um um we had to spend some time with some research um our board felt that it was important to do this certainly recharges is, is um is a technology that had been used around the world and um it just not have been used much in in colorado and so we hired some of the the um the um, most experienced consulting firms in the world. We looked at that, we presented our case uh, to the state and were able to get the state to approve a, uh, a aquifer storage and recharge program. That's a very important program for us. Um, we use that um, when, when we can to, um, uh, when we have wet years, we will use it and put water back into the, um, into the ground in those particular areas. It, it's not as much as if we're running out of water there, as much as it, it does help the um, ability for the well to produce better in the future when we want to use it. It has to do with um, kind of thinking of, of, of a water column. But um, ASR was an investment that Centennial was one of the only communities, one of the only utilities that did it and did it successfully. And I will say that we continue to do it successfully with quite a few of our wells in our system very important um, element of ours. Uh, looking at, at a long-term um, health and benefit for this community. Um, as you can look at the, the next slide, you can see uh, modern and maybe not so modern um, wells. And um, the, of course, the silo, the uh, windmill behind the mansion, and it was actually a, a second um, windmill that existed there back uh, at, well, when, when I came here in 81, <clears throat> out of different formations and, um, and you know, water for the, around the mansion in particular was, was, you know, the only way that they could get water. I think many of you who are docents know that. When we did the renovation of the mansion, we found um, uh, two cisterns underneath the dining room. Um, uh, they were about five foot in diameter. And uh, it showed, excuse me, it showed how water um, was taken from the uh, windmill that lo was located somewhere in the backyard of the mansion and was stored inside the house for daily use. So, um, so groundwater is, is, is and will continue to be part of our future. So uh, our water demand, as uh, Sherry talked about acre feet. Um, so, you know, what are we using and where, do, where are we heading? From the very beginning, when we talked about uh, how much would we need um, a lot of the resources that we utilized were looking at what other other Denver Water, City of Aurora, what um, other communities were using, and we used that to project what how much water we were going to need for this community because we you know we knew that it was a, a rare and precious commodity, and uh, to the extent that we can acquire it early on, that's important to do so. Also, though, we didn't want to acquire so much that that um, it broke the bank, so to speak. So uh, that was always a very important dynamic. And, um, and if you, you've known anything about water rights, um, it's, it's, it will always be a dynamic. There will always be additional um, appropriators on the river. And um, even though you may own a right, you always have to be a watchful of it to make sure that there isn't some kind of an application somewhere that might, um, under certain time periods, um, diminish the amount that you could get. And, um, and as such, I mean, we, we have identified that we needed around 15 to 17,000 um, acre feet in the last couple of years. Um, we do feel that at build out, we would need about 19,000 acre feet. And, um, and I will say that we, we have that, those numbers. 
um, in in water rights. And once again, it's it's water supply and or excuse me, it's water storage that is so important to us. And um, and certainly the addition of Chatfield, where we just started storing water last year, will be a a, a nice a nice piece um, as part of our portfolio. If you look at the next chart, this this shows um, surface to groundwater. And I know that in the beginning of um, of the development, there was concern that Highlands Ranch was going to come in and basically drain the aquifers, was going to take all the water from the existing residents, and um, and was going to just continue to just suck water out of the ground. And that, in fact, is not the, the case at all. And um, as you can see, there's the the blue line at the bottom is the um, groundwater that we have used over the years. And um, and I will say that the amount of water that you are you're given a decree for each well and uh you are a certain amount of water um some of the wells we use a full decree um when we do use that well we don't you know they aren't things you turn on and off on a daily basis um but many of them we don't at all and uh in reality is we we've used just a very small amount of the groundwater that that we have a, a right to because we did continue to develop surface water supply and we identify that and we use that because that's a renewable source as always. Okay, a nice picture. Always like nice pictures. It's a, okay, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes about um, the development and how we worked in partnership with uh, Mission Viejo and Shea Homes in order to kind of manage our, our development and make sure we didn't get uh, out there putting too much money out front, but then also make sure that every home out here had full service and full protection of a of a modern water supply system. So once again, the picture of the mansion and the uh, uh, the outbuildings, um, and as you can see, the the road heading off into the sunset. There is the road that used to connect with Santa Fe. Our community certainly has grown. I mean, uh, like I said, when I started here and was told, yeah, someday this will be 90,000 people, uh, I kind of chuckled uh, growing up in New England. And um, I mean, uh, you, you, somehow you, you don't measure growth quite like that. Um, but as you can see there in 1981, we had 285 residents. Um, and um, by 90, we had just crossed over that 10,000 mark. I remember changing the signs on the entry. Um, that we now had 10,000 residents. Um, and then unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, fortunately, kind of like McDonald's, we stopped changing the population signs because it just kind of happened too too often. So um, so we went to the elevation signs. Um, but, um, but as we moved into uh, the next decade, you know, we went from 10,000 residents to 70,000 residents. The 90s were quite the fast and furious time in this community. A lot of builders, a lot of developers, families coming in, loving it. Um, schools were going in all over the place. It was uh, it was quite the time in Highlands Ranch. Um, in 2010, um, another 10 years later, another 20,000 residents um, had joined the community. <clears throat> and in the, the past decade or so, you know, we've added another 10,000. So what does that look like? I'm going to kind of just pop through these little exhibits here. Um, so this is 1980. Um, the, the little green dots, this is compliments of Douglas County GIS. Um, they, they're white, they, they track every home when the, when the uh, lot was sold. And, uh, and therefore, they were able to create, through the magic of, 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 of GIS, the uh, ability to show us um, the absorption and the growth in the community as the years went on. You can see there in 1980, you got a couple of homes, you got the mansion and then some other mysterious green dot up there in the upper left. Um, then 1990, you know, the Northridge community was, was going quite well. Eastridge was uh, moving along Quebec Street. Um, Lincoln Avenue had been extended out. Highland Ranch High School had been built. And, um, and so you're starting to see the genesis of that in just a few, few homes in, um, on the west side. In uh, 2000, obviously that 70,000 jump 
uh, kind of manifested itself everywhere. Um, and um, it was quite a, um, an important time for us. And one of the things that we did um, in order to, we learned from other communities, we learned from other special districts, is we did everything we could to work with the developers to kind of coordinate as we moved into a different pressure zone, as we moved into a different drainage basin, so that we didn't have to have a, um, infrastructure built that was scattered all over town, and we were only serving a couple dozen homes in each of them. So um, um, Mission Viejo and then uh, Shea were very good at that, and they understood that when we jumped into another area, we needed to build another water tank, another pump station, that they needed to go in there with a big presence. And um, because as we, as those homes were built, we collected a fee called a tap fee. And the tap fee was a fee that the developer paid um, one time when the home was sold to Centennial for the infrastructure that was being built. The, the, um, the, the model was always that development would pay its way. And therefore the existing residents were not gonna pay for capital that was um, being required for the future residents. And, um, and therefore it was important for us to, as we paid for infrastructure, millions of dollars in particular areas that we, we saw you know, a return in the revenue within, you know, within a reasonable time frame, within five years or so. And that helped us pay off our bonds and then keep our, our debt ratio in a very good place. And, um, and, and therefore you can see how, how important it was for us to do that. In 2010, you can see um, kind of filling in some of the corners here or there. And then next in 2015, um, while that's still five years ago, um, you can see most of the community was uh, defined. You know, most of the areas um, of course, the business park area in particular was still, you know, uh, developing out and, uh, and we, you know, we've seen quite a bit of growth in that in the last few years, but, um, but, you know, Highlands Ranch really became quite the place. I have to say that um, I really knew that Highlands Ranch had arrived back sometime in the early 90s when Stormy Rodman, um, the weatherman, uh, would, would call out the, the uh, temperature and everything for um, Highlands Ranch. I knew we had arrived at that point that we, we made it onto the to the 10 o'clock news. So, so in 2018, if you look at the, this picture, you can now look at what was behind the mansion and uh, what was open prairie, of course, is now a, a, a vibrant community and uh, a community that has a, a great mix of open space. Um, and that open space serves as a great um, corridor for a variety of things for our drainage, for certainly for wildlife uh, recreation, and uh, it also is provided us some great opportunities for our infrastructure. We were able to run some of our major pipelines uh, up and down to that area, and that really helped a lot. And um, it kept our costs at a at a uh, a good level, and it also makes it fairly easy for uh, access for maintenance. And the next picture is kind of a um, a summary. You know, showing, you know, at 97%, at we have, you know, almost 35,000, I'm sure we have 35,000 by now, um, uh, residential units and um, 20 million square feet of, of non-residential, um, 41 schools, two hospitals. I mean, um, a, a real integrated community. And as part of that, Centennial had to make sure that we were providing, you know, essentially, the same level of, of services that, um, that were needed for every home that moved in here, every building that moved in here. There wasn't anybody that said, well, you know, we're gonna have to share water. I mean, throughout this, we were always looking at, at making sure that we were uh, you know, ahead of the game enough to, to not inhibit um, the new uh, residents as they moved in and then also meet the needs of that. And, uh, and that was demonstrated um, most recently, um, when South Metro Fire um, had a um, uh, fire departments have um, what's known as insurance services offices, it's a um, ISO rating. And, um, and while the ISO rating they received, um, which is one, it's the highest rating, uh, was based on the, 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 the strength and the durability of their 
of their uh, fire department. It is also based on the um, strength and uh, reliability of your water system. And, um, and so we're evaluated for that. And, um, and that helps contribute to um, always being able to deliver that, which in theory results in lower in, uh, insurance rates. So as we move through, I talked about construction. And, um, and as you can see there, this is a water storage tank. Um, this one's up, uh, up at Daniels Park Road. Um, we would go in and build these. Oftentimes, we would build uh, a, we could build a single storage tank that could serve two pressure zones until the community got built out in that area, and then we would add the other one. That way, we we could kind of phase the the, the uh, spending <coughs> uh, within the community itself, the water and sewer lines in your street. Those were actually built by the developer and funded by the developer. That was part of their cost um, as when they they figured out what they needed to do to build a home in that particular neighborhood. Um, they built those in accordance with plans and specifications that were approved by us, and we provided full inspection of that. And therefore, once again, it was kind of that partnership that allowed um, the, um, the community to not be overly committed in debt and, um, and, and also provide the, the services that are needed. The infrastructure, um, I've spoken a little bit to this and um, certainly it, it's pretty impressive, but uh, the Joe, Joseph Blake uh, water treatment plant, I will say that the uh, water treatment plant, I'll show you a picture in a bit here of the 1981. And uh, that was our very first one. And then um, when, um, when Mr. Mr. Blake served on the uh, Centennial board for many, many years and, um, and, was, and as well as on the Metro board and was a leader in many ways, and when when um, when he went to um, to move on from here, um, we felt it was um, important to acknowledge the contribution that he made, along with several others of the founding fathers, if you will. And uh, and as such, this um, the water plant was named in his honor. And um, and it, it's a it's 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 a great looking place. Um, you know, I, I won't say state of the art because I always get you. In trouble, um, but it's it's it it, ma it uh, matches every technology that we need. Uh, we're looking at at doing some upgrades in the next few years, but um, but uh, a great facility and um, and very important to the uh, ability to provide surface water to our community. We have over 450 miles of water pipelines, um, over 300 miles of sewer lines. Um, just in our Marcy Gulch wastewater plant, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, um, was also discharges our wastewater into the South Platte River, or treated water, excuse me, and um, in with some of the highest environmental standards that you will find um, that are required for a wastewater plant. The uh, tap fees, um, as I spoke before, these were, these were funded by the developer. You know, a lot of what Centennial did was looked at ways to provide innovative um, financing so that um, we, we did not uh, create a, uh, a burden on our on our residents with with excessively high rates with on the metro side with excessively high taxes um, and that had to do with managing how you spend your money and and when you spend your money in order to uh, make that work um, as I spoke of the reinvestment and in, in capture capital infrastructure at 40 years old yeah we need a couple couple things fixed here or there. And we also, standards um, increase and therefore we need to look at, at um, being able to uh, meet those, those future standards as they come down the line. The uh, next colorful map is our water and wastewater system, or actually this is our water system. And, um, and you know, there's that 450 miles of pipe. And the uh, different colors are the different pressure zones. We have six different pressure zones within the community. And, um, um, and we have a, a team of um, operations staff and, and that just do an outstanding job on that. The next slide is um, our water system in 81. And um, when I came on board in June of 81, um, uh, one of my first jobs was building a water storage tank. Well, actually it was picking up a water storage tank that was under construction. And it's the one on university. 
and um, and uh, it, it kind of sat out by itself. But um, but you know it was important that we set it up there and we ran a pipeline from there all the way back to essentially McClellan Reservoir in order to provide water service there. Our water treatment plant was a small three million gallon per day treatment plant. Um, you can see in the pictures there. There's the three blue units. Those were um, are called package units, and they're used oftentimes by smaller communities. And we use those up until the um, commission of our new plant, and then we actually removed those and sold them to a, a, a town up in the mountains that was able to reuse them. Um, the next slide shows you the um, that's the Marshy Gulch wastewater plant, and uh, to kind of show you. I mean, where you needed to be on that. Um, in the distance, on the far distance there is the, um, the community that would be Northridge and all that. So it sat out there off of Santa Fe all by itself. And, um, and we had a pipeline that ran all the way down to that location, still do, um, to carry the wastewater down to that. Um, and then um, the next slide shows another picture of that as we were building some of it. And part of what we needed to do on that was, of course, make sure that we we um, we sized it appropriately so that we had the ability to uh, to do that. And standards, as I said, for that stretch of uh, the South Bight River, very strict. And therefore, you know, we we were um, very much um, on top of what we needed to do for treatment on that. And um, the next slide is um, all things need to be fixed and or not fixed, but upgraded from time to time. And this is our current mace. Marcy Gulch Wastewater Plant project that's underway. It's a project that's almost $80 million, um, has to do with a lot of equipment and materials that have been in the ground, uh, been uh, there since we built the, the first plant in, um, in 84. And, um, and uh, we had a small package unit um, from 81 to 84. And, um, and, uh, and as such, new standards, additional treatment. And, you know, we're now treating pretty much the entire community. And unlike water, you can't turn sewer off. You know, it's, uh, it keeps coming. The Joe Blake Water Treatment Plant, um, as you can see there, um, this is the entrance. That first thing is a, is a, the, one of the first stops for the water where um, you start to filter it. And, um, and then it starts to move through uh, additional levels of treatment. And uh, the next slide shows you aerial, and that's actually a, a facility that we are also looking at um, moving forward with an upgrade to that facility. And uh, we see that happening um, somewhat in the next couple of years and going into the, the next five to seven years. And uh, once again, trying to do what we can do to phase our, our construction so that we can, um, uh, control our, our spending. The next image is a wastewater, uh, excuse me, is a pump station. It's the last pump, new pump station we'll have to build. This is a, um, a pump station located off of Broadway, just north of Wildcat. And, um, and if you were to look down in it, it goes about 35 feet in the ground. So um, it's, um, uh, but it's, it's very important. It, it carries water to um, some of our upper pressure zones that represent about 60% of our demand in the whole community. Um, certainly throughout this, and I spoke a little bit to this, our 300 and our, our uh, 500 miles of water line and our sewer line, we have a, 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 a set of, of crew members that are just outstanding. And if any of you have had the misfortune and or um, opportunity to be in, a, in the vicinity of them when they're working in the middle of the night in freezing weather uh, while they repair a line. They just do just such an outstanding job. And um, we, we have started as we incorporated a, um, a, 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 a asset management program. And in doing so, it, it's allowing us to monitor every activity that goes on in them, maintenance and this and that, and is really kind of uh, streamlined our ability to communicate. When Once you, you read up, serve at 100,000 people, you know, you need to, it, uh, you just can't count on one guy with the notes, you know, so, um, so this has really worked out well for us. Okay, I know you're all taking bets on when my voice is gonna go, but it's, um, 
Um, but I, I have a few more slides. So, partnerships, successes. I spoke of um, our ability to play the long game. You know, several of the projects that we started in the 90s are just coming to fruition. Um, certainly, throughout this, even though um, the here and now is meeting your demands of the day, we also know that we need to meet the demands of the future. While Highland Trans itself will not necessarily grow, um, into, you know, at the levels of like some of the other communities, Castle Rock, let's say, into the future, we certainly know that um, we have a, a, a very important um, asset here, a very important community, and there are a lot of elements of it that, that we need to keep watch on. And, um, and as such, we, we are always looking for opportunities to, to, to look at, at how best to use renewable resources, such as the surface water um, in Chatfield, and, um, and, and uh, also look at um, our ability to, to provide efficient use of the water that we have. And, um, and I think one of the things that, um, that happened in the 2003, 2004 time period is we looked around and we actually looked across the Western US and how certain utilities were managing water. And we identified that, I mean, we, were, we always had, had required um, low flow devices in the homes. We certainly were all metered and we certainly were doing our best to reach out to, to community members. But we also realized that um, we needed to give people somewhat of a, of a um, benchmark as to how much water they really should be using at any given time throughout the year. It's not a good idea to turn your water on in, in May 1 and just turn it off on November 1st. So, um, so we created a water budget. Uh, model and that's a water budget model that uh, relies on not just the um, the seasonal temperatures but also the size of a lot and how much um, your irrigated area should require and um, and yet we we never wanted to be um, in a position where we were prohibiting somebody um, and therefore what we did is we moved through and created this water budget which has a a stepped rate and um, and within the 100 percent of your water budget, you pay the base rate. If, for reasons um, of variety of reasons, you choose to use more water, it certainly costs us more to provide that water, not to acquire it, but to treat it, to store it, to have that available. Because let's face it, it's almost always in the summer, and uh, and as such, we looked at a way of of having the uh, customers be able to provide that, um, help fund that. Um, in, a, in a pro rata type of basis. Um, what we found is when we instituted the uh, water budgets, it was, it was without a doubt an educational process. But, um, but over time, we saw actually about a 15% reduction uh, across our entire community on how much um, water had been saved. I think people just started to pay attention a little bit more about it. And, um, and I will say, while other some other utilities have adopted water budget, not necessarily exactly like ours. They they have learned from our experience, and we've learned from our experience. We we've, we've refined it over the years. But once again, it was just a way to look at how best that we could um, represent our community, and um, but without being kind of um, um, what without creating a, a kind of blocks, and um, and hopefully creating opportunities for people. I, I live in a home that I moved in in 87. I have a lot more shade in my house now than I ever did before. And therefore I have areas in my yard that I know I don't need to water near as much. And uh, just making people aware of, of the dynamics of that um, are always helpful. I, um, uh, as you can see here in this, this diagram, um, this is um, the uh, water, water use by community. And, uh, and you can see in there that, that we, we uh, represent some of the lowest water use per unit uh, above other utilities in the area. And, um, and that's, we're proud of that. I mean, we have, we have great homes. We have, you know, large families. I mean, there's, there, there's always going to be some demographic evolution, but, um, but we also think that there's um, opportunities for education and, and uh, certainly outreach and, and our, um, 
our, our water resource group, our community relations group have used a lot of vehicles to reach out to the community. Um, and, uh, and if you wanna get um, additional updates, Sherry, what is what is the, the thing called? Yeah, if, if you'd like to get regular e-newsletters that are specific to water, just send us a message at info at centennialwater.org. Again, that's info at centennialwater.org and we'll sign you up for the e-newsletters. They come out once a month and we'll keep your email address to ourselves. Okay, we're on the home stretch here. So um, next slide on finance. Um, financial stability. Um, this is something that is, or excuse me, financial management, excuse me, um, is, um, is just so essential. I mean, throughout this entire process, um, our finance staff has worked in partnership with the board of directors and with the, um, uh, our, 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 both our operations team and our, our capital team in order to figure out how best to um, manage our, our expenditures. There have been examples of other places where um, things just get built too too soon, too fast, too big, and um, and by the time you actually get to realize um, the the true potential of that that particular facility, it's already kind of needing certain levels of replacement, and therefore part of what we needed to do was look at ways that we could phase projects, we could stage projects. Um, and uh, as well as, and, and our finance staff would not only just look at that, they would look at their cash flow management, figure out how best to do investments. Um, they have an excellent audit record. They're, the, um, they, when they look at rate projections, they look at, at it out based on the various needs that we have from an operational standpoint, from a capital standpoint, and, um, and then from market. And they typically project those rates out for um, five plus years in order to look at ways to provide a, uh, a, a nice, reliable, steady um, program. The, um, um, the next slide talks a little bit about uh, that we aren't the only ones that think they're doing a pretty good job. That um, in recent years, both Standard and Poor's and, um, and Fitch have looked at ratings um, for the district in, in relation to bonds. And um, and they gave uh, Standard Poor's gave them a triple A, and um, and uh, and Fitch gave a double A plus. Um, that's pretty tremendous for a, a government and a utility like this. Denver Water actually has one of the only communities that has, um, excuse me, one of the only utilities that has that um, in the state of Colorado. It's very strong, and um, and that should make you feel good. Um, that the money is being watched because, let's face it, those rating agencies, they don't have any favorites. And, um, and they come in and they evaluate not just your financial records, but they look at the strength of your system, of your, your management, your leadership. And, um, and, they, and based on that, they, they make recommendations as to the, what they feel is um, the stability of the organization. And that re that, that's reflected in bond um, rates when, um, when debt has to be issued. Um, our water and sewer rates are some of the lowest in the region. And uh, you can see there, this is a comparison from uh, 2020. And, um, and uh, you, you can see in there that our, our rates on the orange bar are set as compared to city of Littleton, excuse me, yeah, city of Littleton is provided by Denver, Castle Rock, Parker, Castle Pines, Roxboro, and then Sterling Ranch on the far right side. Um, and that's, that's important. It's important that um, our community have a, a good, um, reliable water system. And we believe that we have, um, without a doubt, one of the best. We have certainly um, a, a much more balanced portfolio from a surface water and groundwater than most communities. And, um, and yet we're still able to deliver that. And um, that's, that's due to a, uh, many decades of, of, of work by a lot of individuals. Our staff resources, um, 88 employees. And, um, and you know, as I made reference before, there are some of these, these groups that are shared between the Metropolitan District and Centennial. And then certainly some of them are, are dedicated primarily to that. And our water and wastewater operators, I mean, this most recent storm, of course, 
those those facilities run 24 7 and um so you know when when the storm was a coming you know we made sure that you know they had everything they need and and um and in the event that uh, they might get stuck there for a little longer than they planned past their shift um future improvements um opportunities as i talked about our water treatment plant we're looking at some additional efficiencies some um you know with with, with the advent of both the chatfield reservoir project and the south plant reservoir project we now have three water storage reservoirs that we can bring water in and um and that's important because they all have a little different type of water quality and so at different times of the year different parts of the season we may choose one or the other to do that and uh in our water treatment plant it's uh, very important that we you know we have a, a good um flexible system that can adapt to the various measures that take place um automated meter infrastructure um we are moving along with a program called ami which will actually allow real-time measurement of your water flow um you know uh, using the phone app if you want um it'll allow us to um, read meters remotely it's going to take a while it's going we're replacing about a thousand a year but it'll allow uh, customers to um to check their water use uh particularly in the summertime and stuff to make sure that you know they don't have a leak in the system that they they don't know about and um so we're moving forward with that that technology and certainly we're always on networking and working with other utilities um on water conservation and efficiency moves and while we we did just receive a you know a, a gift from from the heavens in the last few days um with all this this wet moisture certainly we're still in a um a drought cycle and uh and so we we always want to manage our resources and um and with that i'm going to shut up so we can um take some questions uh david and nancy if you'd like sure i'm making sure that uh, everybody can now unmute themselves and can ask a few questions I, and I guess while they're waiting to do that, I know you said, Jeff, uh, in part of your presentation that we're at somewhere between 15 and 17,000 acre feet right now, and that at build out, you expect it to be closer to 20,000. Is Centennial Water out there looking for the additional water rights already? Well, we, we have water rights that will meet that need, um, um, whether it be through surface or groundwater. We're always looking for opportunities. Um, for uh, if, a, uh, if a water right becomes available, you know, certainly there have been times when property ownership has transitioned, um, sometimes uses have changed. And uh, so we'll always be looking for those and measuring those against some of the ones that we currently have. But we do have um, adequate supply to meet that demand. Oh, that is great to hear. <laughs> yeah, as I say, overall, it's been a very fa fascinating subject. Uh, I know the other one you talked about was uh, making sure we had storage. And you said Chatfield was just coming online. Uh, will that meet the anticipated storage needs, or are you anticipating that we're going to need even more storage in the future? Well, there there are set levels for the um, the storage, and um, and and essentially the participants in it um, utilize water rights that they may have to store water in that. And um, and actually as part of the process, they also did file a storage right for that. So, you know, there are certain times of year that, that where the, the condition exists, not very often at times, and sometimes, no, sometimes never in a year, called Free River. And Free River is when every water right downstream is being met. And therefore there is water that is available, that is flowing. And to the extent somebody has the ability to store it, and has a, a, a you know a, a a right for it they can store that and um that will definitely be one of the ways we will do it we will also make use of our junior water rights that oftentimes um may not be in priority and uh, we can store water 
in Chatville because of that, as well as the other participants, Castle Dines, um, being one Parker. There's uh, several, as well as, like I said, Denver Water is a big player in that. I see at least a couple questions that have come in through the chat. Uh, first one just says water quality. So, uh, how do how 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 do we measure water quality and how is that maintained? Um, we we have a, a lab, a full fully staffed lab that run just just tens of thousands of tests a a year and and uh, run throughout the you know. Every day, our, our treatment plant operators are constantly testing water um, as it goes out, and uh, there there are set requirements uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act that we need to meet, and uh, and we we always meet those, and um, and we measure those, and and in fact, we'll be issuing a uh, report. I'm going to let Sherry address that in a minute. Yes, we um, we publish an annual water quality report. It's the requirement of the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that is posted to our website at centennialwater.org. That's centennialwater.org. And you can find the, the 2020 report there. And then this spring, uh, by gosh, end of April, we'll be publishing a new 2021 water quality report and you'll see in there that includes information on the test results of all of those tests that Jeff just mentioned that are run in our lab throughout the year. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, another question that's on here is with all this wonderful snow that fell from the sky in the last uh, couple of days, how is snow melt water captured and treated? How is snow melt captured? Yep. Treated. Oh, um, well, the it it's back to the um, the uh, cycle of storage. I mean, to the extent that there is snow melt that um, exists um, upstream, and it becomes part of the overall wa water the watershed portfolio for the South Platte River, you know, then that will come down and it'll be captured in, in like for centennial at least in the various reservoirs that um, I've identified. Um, I will say McClellan Reservoir also does receive um, runoff from Highlands Ranch through the Dakhark Gulch. And um, some of that water is um, released as part of, um, you, you, you can never um, retain what is known as historic flows. So water that would normally have flown or uh, have flowed uh, as a result of snow melt into that basin prior to Highlands Ranch will be released back into the river because somebody downstream is relying on that historically. But water that is in excess of the historic flows can be captured to the extent that we have available storage in McClellan. And, um, and then as such, it would be, it would go to our water treatment plant and treat it just like any other type of water. And when you treat the water, do you put uh, fluoride in the water? Yeah, chlorine. Yes, we do. Okay. Fluoride. 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 Fluoride was. Oh, fluoride. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Hearing. Uh, no, we do not put fluoride in. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another question is here: Is are you involved in any of the stormwater projects here in Douglas County, where we are collecting runoff and then use controlled release to capture the of the captured water? Um, in, in Douglas County, I'm not, um, I mean, I know backcountry um, does capture water and they have a controlled release um, back to that historic flow um, uh, situation where they have to release any flow that's considered historic. And, um, but they do have uh, some locations where they do capture some water and uh, then can reuse it. Um, because if it's new water to the system, then they can reuse that for irrigation. All right. I say, is there any other questions this evening? Uh, either you can unmute yourself and say them, or you can throw them in chat real quick. <coughs> All right. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for uh, putting up with some of the uh, technical glitches we had tonight. I'm not sure what's going on, but we will definitely review that and try to make it more seamless in the future, both for our presenters and for our audience. 
Uh, and then a big thank you to uh, Sherry and Jeff. Uh, and a reminder that we haven't, uh, Nancy put in there earlier, but there is an oral history on Joe Blake that is available on our website. And if you haven't signed up for our mailing list, please sign up there. Uh, David, may I have one other yep. quick thing our end? Okay. Yeah, um, I just want to remind, thank you. I just want to remind um, people that are still on the call that the public comment period for the Senior Center, uh, Future Senior Center location, it, it ends tomorrow. And so if people would like to provide a comment, they can do so uh, the most convenient way if they have internet access and a computer is um, that they can comment on our website, which is highlandsranch.org, and that's highlandsranch.org. And then if they go to um, the Senior Center planning page, they'll see there's a link to the comment form, and they can comment on that uh, through 1159 tomorrow night. Um, if they'd like to bring something to the Metro District building, uh, our building is currently closed due to COVID. However, uh, they can drop it in the mail slot and we'll include that comment as well if they, if they prefer to do it in writing, not through the website. Our address is 62 Plaza Drive here in Highlands Ranch. We're just on the southwest corner of Broadway and Plaza Drive. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thank you to the audience members that uh, found a way first to get in and then stayed with us all the way till uh, 845 this evening. So thank you all. Uh, we appreciate it. And as we said, we will get this uh, recording out to everyone. And I'm thrilled that we had this because i am always been interested in water and it is a very interesting history of water that we've been able to provide here. Thank you all and have a good night. Thanks.